across the UK on DAB Digital Radio, on the free Times Radio app, and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. Hello, everyone. Great to have your company. It's Rick Kelsey with you on Times Radio Drive until 7 o'clock tonight. Don't forget, if you want to get in contact with us, you can text 87222, start your message at the word Times. You can tweet at Times Radio, or you can email the studio here, studio at times.radio. And in just over two weeks, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak will become the next Prime Minister. We've had a week that's seen the lobby digging into past comments made by Liz Truss and a high-profile former cabinet minister has come out in support of Rishi Sunak. To dissect all the action of the week, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by Georgia L. Gilholly, who has written for Conservative Home. Hello, Georgia. Hi, good to be here. We've got Andrew Eyre, a councillor of Seven Oaks Kippington. He's backing Rishi Sunak. Hello, Andrew. Uh, good evening to you, Rick. And Ems Barr, a former Conservative special advisor who's backing Liz Trust. Hello, Ems. Good afternoon. So let's start off with this leak recording then. This, from back in 2012, caused quite a stir. If British workers um, produce less per hour, than, and that's a combination of kind of skill and application. Because this has been a historical fact for decades. Yeah. Essentially, it's partly a sort of mindset and attitude thing. Yeah, it's working culture, basically. If you go to China, it's quite different, I can assure you. You know, there's a, there's a fundamental issue of British working culture. And it's not, essentially, if we're going to be a richer country and a more prosperous country, that needs to change. But I don't think people are that keen to change that. So I think there's a slight... There's a slight thing in Britain about wanting the easy answers. And I think that's, you know, that's my reflection on the election and what's gone before it. Ems, um, so I'll come to you first on this. Was this a damaging leak for a candidate who's put patriotism at the centre of their campaign? Well, I don't think that any out of context um, comments that are accusing or appear to accuse the British worker of not being dedicated, um, particularly during this huge cost of living crisis, are in any way helpful. Um, but I don't think that it has changed the dial at all. If you look at the numbers, I mean, even MPs now, which was, I think, Rishi Sunak's main campaign point was more MPs supported him than supported um, Liz. Even the MPs are still coming out in their droves to announce their support for Liz Trust. So I don't think that it's moved the dial, but obviously it wasn't helpful. Georgia, she made the comments when she was Chief Secretary to the Treasury. A post she held until 2019, is she allowed to have changed her view? Well, everyone's allowed to have changed their views, but I think in politics we're likely to assume that the reason someone has changed their views is for cynical reasons and obviously I can't you know look into Liz Truss's brain but I think it's more than likely she has a similar view I mean I think in some ways you can see that what she's saying is okay Britain could be more efficient work culture could be more efficient etc but um it does seem you know maybe not an appropriate comment especially in particular she positions herself who's someone who's quite um hawkish towards the Chinese government, for example, and yet she gives China as an example of somewhere that has a better working culture. I mean, the fact that China has swathes of forced labour and people uh, in offices work, work in offices or apartments where there are nets to stop people from jumping off the buildings and committing suicide because they're so fed up with the way they're treated by the system, I think probably not the best comparison. But, you know, every, everyone's made a stupid comment, so it's not necessarily a reflection mm. of a total philosophy. Andrew, digging up old comments, the lobby doing this, is this just political cancel culture? It absolutely is. There's no point in doing it. It, it doesn't help anybody, as, as Ems has said. The looking back, producing clips of something said out of context doesn't help the argument and doesn't help the country. Uh, we, we should all be looking positively to what each candidate, whether it's Rishi Sunak or, or Liz Truss, what they're going to do for the country, what they're going to do for uh, the workers and the uh, wage earners in this country. So it doesn't help anybody and we just need to look forward. Are we at a point now, Andrew, that Rishi Sunak could do with any kind of boost, though? Uh, well, they're clearly one of the things you have to remember is, is the falseness of, uh, of polls. We saw us in 2019 when uh, Boris Johnson spoke to the silent majority. Silent, it was a majority 
of people and to, came back with an 80 seat majority. So I think looking at polls is always going to be difficult. People need to make their mind up uh, and look for the future. And at the end of the day, it's the economy. That's the only important thing. There's clear blue water between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak of how you do that. And people look and say, what's the best way for the economy of Great Britain to move forward with? Yeah, and on the polls, um, today in The Times, uh, we've seen this Michael Gove intervention to back um, Rishi Sunak, or you're backing, Andrew. Um, and he says he can clearly still win. We don't know what um, conservative voters are thinking. Ems, were you surprised that, that Michael Gove made this intervention today? Because it's come so late, hasn't it? You would have thought at this point, most people would have, would have made up their minds. Uh, no, I wasn't at all surprised. Um, also, I'm not surprised that he took the time to listen to the different offers. He's a very cerebral man in my experience, and I'm, I'm not surprised that he has made this intervention late. Um, so I'm just going um, to okay. turn you down for a second. We're going to call you back and try and improve that line, but I'm going to kind of throw the same question over to Georgia. Um, this intervention today by Michael Gove, two weeks to go until the end of this contest, he's come in and he said he's now backing Rishi Sunak, saying he can still win. Why now, Georgia, do you think he's done it? Why, why not three weeks ago? Once again, we're obviously sort of left to make assumptions, but from what I've been reading today and maybe my take on it is that he's waited this long because it's sort of, it sort of doesn't help either of them really. Um, he's sort of getting his own back at this trust by obviously going against her and then leaving it so long that people may have already sent their votes who might have sort of um, been swayed by his endorsement of Rishi Sunak. But obviously we know now from the article that Michael Gove is going to take a step back from frontline politics. So, you know, it's in his interest maybe to do it this late. And But, you know, we don't know what he's going to do after this. I know he's worked as a journalist before, so mm. he could still be quite influential in his uh, comments. Well, I think he said he's happy to stay in the back benches. Andrew, as someone who sees the inner workings of the Conservative Party as a councillor in Sevenoaks, um, how much influence does an intervention like this from Michael Gove have? I mean, he's had some incredible positions. He was a cabinet minister back in 2010 under Cameron. Three prime ministers he's had. Uh, yes, and I think we have to be careful about what he said and, and potentially what he meant. He said he didn't expect to be in a front bench uh, play, position. It doesn't mean to say he wouldn't turn it down if he was offered one. He's certainly a heavy hitter. He's certainly a heavyweight politician. And he's, uh, as uh, Ems said before we lost her, you know, he is a clear thinker and, a, and gets things done. So would he make a difference is your question? Mm. I think he will. But as Georgia was saying... It's a clearly a very late intervention uh, and I question how many people are still left to vote in, well, in, the, in the membership. Yeah, I think we've got Ems back and in the piece, Gove writes that he doesn't think the election is already decided and that Tory members won't be unduly influenced by whether this or that candidate has run a smarter race by the rules of the Westminster game. I mean, it's quite clunky phrasing, but Ems, do you agree with that? Um, yes, I do, actually. I think that one thing that has been shown um, sort of in the, the polls, I mean, I know the only poll that really matters is the one, is the actual vote, but also in our party membership's reaction to the disgraceful way our pri current prime minister was treated by some of his MPs, that what goes on in the Westminster bubble isn't just not reflective of what's going on in the country. It's not even reflective of our party membership. So I would totally agree, yes. Um <laughs> When, when when you look at the situation now, Georgia, where, where we're at with, with two weeks to go, how do you see the, the, the frame in which this race has been conducted? Do you feel like it's basically gone on uh, for three weeks too long and we could have wrapped this up in the middle of July? I mean, the way that media's been presenting it for quite some days now is that it's pretty much a done deal for Liz Truss. And obviously, as everyone else has been saying, we don't really know in terms of how many people have cast their votes, etc. But in terms of the polls, of course, Rishi Sunak might still be able to win, but it does seem unrealistic. He's been, he went down in the Conhome polls for quite some time before Boris Johnson's uh, final fall from grace. You know, he had the green card scandal and obviously getting the party gate fine didn't help him. And with him being chancellor in the economy, all those things sort of snowballed into him going down in the polls. 
And Liz Truss has been up for quite some time. I believe she was um, top of the Tory uh, cabinet league poll that Conholm does every month from about November last year to March. And then she was second place, second to third place. She might have gone between those to Ben Wallace. So she's clearly more popular with the membership than Rishi Sunak and has been for quite some time. And obviously in this race, popularity with the, with the membership is, is what matters. So it's just kind of that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if you heard um, Matt Ford, the comedian. He was he was speaking to Aisha uh, in a tape we played before from from the Edinburgh Fringe. And he he was saying to Labour, "Do not underestimate the Conservatives," and basically said, despite there being a fifteen point lead in the polls right now, the highest that it's been uh, for over ten years for Labour, that actually the work that they still have to do in putting across their argument is enor- is enormous. And and that Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak still have a real chance in the next general election. I mean, do, do you think that's a fair uh, characteristic that it, that that Matt Ford kind of portrayed there? That that Labour have, have still got a lot to do. Oh well, they absolutely have a lot to do if they want to come close to power, and rightly so. Their policies are not going to help us get out of the cost of living crisis, and. It's actually, even before um, we were down to the final two, I think that everyone looking at the selection of candidates that the Conservatives had were 100 times better than any possibility that Labour had put forward. And they really, really shouldn't underestimate either Liz or Rishi um, or any of the rest of the Conservative Party, because we're the party that has the policies that are going to improve the Britain's con- this country. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, what's going on with rail strikes uh, next with Georgia, Andrew and Ems. You're listening to Times Radio Drive with Rick Kelsey sitting in for Aisha Hazarika. This is Times Radio. Good evening, everybody. We're reviewing the week in politics with Georgia L. Gilholy, who's written for Conservative Home, Andrew Eyre, a councillor from Seven Oaks, and Ems Bar, a former Conservative special advisor who's backing Liz Trust. Uh, let's go on to rail strikes now, um, panel, if we can. Uh, there's more travel disruption today as 45,000 rail workers take part in a further strike over paying conditions. Both Rishi Sunak and Liz Trust have actually said that they ban strikes on a, a essential public services such as the railways. Uh, Andrew, I'll come to you first on this, if I may. Uh, Would you like to see the next PM uh, toughen up laws on strike action? I think it's probably inevitable. Uh, Whether I wanted to see it or not is probably less relevant, but it is undoubtedly uh, inevitable. The unions are ganging up, whatever they, they feel they're doing independently. They are deliberately ganging up. They are taking it out on the British people. I was in a, a discussion with a, a train driver who was, wasn't on strike because he's separate talk to the ones which are being on strike. And one of his justifications was that they must have their Sunday rest day. Now, obviously, mm. uh, those customers are not allowed to travel on Sundays uh, because the 1950s uh, set of rules by which the, the unions follow means that customers don't matter. Uh, so I think it's 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 probably inevitable that the unions themselves are putting putting a, a, an open goal into the uh, Conservative Party and the government in order to protect real people. George, this seems to be about bringing in legislation to introduce minimum service levels and critical national infrastructure, which both candidates uh, are, are backing. How high up the political priority list do you think this will be for them? Um, I think that, as as you were saying, it is quite likely that these measures are going to be um, taken. However, in terms of priorities, probably not that much. And I think, you know, for a lot of people now, they do drive. And I'm someone who actually takes trains a lot, takes the tube in London a lot as well. So I probably experience it more than most people. I think we really do need to have improvements in the rail system. But the issue is, I was also speaking to someone on the railways the other day when I was on a train and it was delayed. He was, um, you know, a ticket conductor and he said he'd been working on the railway since the late 80s. And he said that it, at the start of the 90s, they were being told in a few years time, things will be better. Um, you know, you won't have to work so much overtime. And he said things haven't changed. And we need to remember that it's not just rail drivers who are on, you know, often decent salaries were striking. It's the conductors, it's the staff on the trains who often aren't paid that much, often have to do a lot of overtime. And they're, they're regular people too. So I don't like 
the way that the government sort of tries to frame it as, you know, people who are working on the railways and striking are against hardworking people. Well, they're mm. also hardworking people. And I think that having minimum service levels, uh, levels sorry, for key industries does make sense, especially the NHS, for example. However, the reason why these people are striking is because they're trying to... Um, they're trying to pressure for decent wages for themselves, which is what anyone would do out of self-interest. So I think it's, you know, if Liz Truss loves the free market so much, she should understand why people are trying to fight for their own, you know, their own interests, especially when inflation is soaring. And I think that the rails are, railways are probably not going to be in the industry that is going to be doing this, um, depending on how the economy goes um, with inflation still climbing, energy bills set to get even worse. I mean, it's just horrific. I suppose how far do we go in that? Police and prison officers, they're not allowed to strike. But but how far does an XPM potentially push this with, with industries away from rail that they're not allowed to strike, do you think, Georgia? I mean, w- would you like to, to, do you think they're likely to go further than just the, the rail industry? I mean, I mean, who knows? I think that if if there are certain levels of striking, I think they would take more action. I think it depends on the circumstances, whether it's appropriate or not. But, you know, throughout history, this is how people have fought for work, better working conditions and better wages. It's hardly surprising. I mean, back in the day, police did actually strike. But I think it was in the early 1920s. There was a huge yeah. um, there was a huge strike that um, uh, were lots of violent clashes. And then they did outlaw um, police striking. Um, so I think it's one of those very fluid situations. I mean, I don't know where it will go. But I personally have a lot of empathy for people who are striking, who work on the railways. Ems, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you may have a slightly different opinion on this. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. How does the next prime minister break the stalemate on strikes? I do have a different opinion. And I think the one thing that hasn't been mentioned, which is absolutely crucial to this debate, is that this the latest pay deal hasn't been put to union members. There's an 8% pay deal on the table from the Transport Secretary and the current prime minister, which hasn't been put to members. So... With all due respect, we can't know whether that's something that the individual workers are supporting or not. All we know is that it's the leadership of the unions who aren't accepting it. What what, what was put to the members, though, is what we do know um, was they got an an offer of 5% to the members. Although this depends on whether workers accept modernising reforms. Uh, But the RMT replied to that figure, not the 8% figure, calling it a paltry sum. So... I'm just kind of still lost at what number breaks the deadlock, Ems. Well, we'll see, won't we, when the unions decide to give their members a voice and off and show and give them the option of whether or not they would like to take this 8% pay deal or whether they want to continue striking. But I think that it's a very false debate at the moment to even right. to say that this is what the members of these unions feel when they haven't been given the option. Uh, Andrew, how would you like the government and, uh, and and the railways to approach these negotiations? Is there, is there something you think they're missing out on? I think one of the things they're missing out on is how to deal with a very fluent and very clever uh, union leadership, leadership. So Mick Lynch is sitting there saying, we're not going to do anything until Grand Shaps is in the room. And Grand Shapps can't go in the room because he's not the controlling figure, whatever Mick Lynch says. So I think the that's the difficulty. How do how do I see it being handled? I think continuing as it is. At some point, as Ems was saying, the silent minority I talked about before, silent majority, will get out and start talking and saying, uh, well, I can't afford to do this anymore. Actually, this is a reasonable deal. And why are we sticking out, as the miners did, if we're going back in the 80s, 70s and 80s, uh, as the miners did, sticking it out, sticking it out for an unattainable uh, amount. And eventually the people saying, enough's enough, I'm going to take what I, what, I, what I want. Well, that's a compelling point, because if we had, we're having this discussion pre-February uh, 2020, I, yes. I'm not sure things would have got this far, that four months on we'd still be uh, no closer to a, 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 an agreement than we are um, than we were back in May. Do, do you think then, because the twenty percent drop in passenger numbers and the way that we work now, as in COVID, many of us more more work at home and we don't rely on the trains as much, has framed this this negotiation slightly different, Andrew? Absolutely, I think the difficulty now for the rail industry is it is in the late fifties. 
And I, I foresee, unfortunately, a 63 beaching cut coming because the government, the industry, the country cannot afford the uh, rail system it has at the moment. And it certainly can't afford to carry on with HS2 and improve it the way the Europeans have already done so in the past couple of decades. So yes, I think the, the circumstances have framed the argument and circumstances will continue to frame the argument and people like Mick Lynch are still stuck in the past. Right, I want to move from um, trains to Scotland and Northern Ireland now and the um, the case for the union. Both candidates headed to Perth earlier this week uh, to give their pitches to their Scottish members. Both oppose a referendum on Scottish independence despite uh, Scottish government plans to hold a vote in October of 2023. And they would like to see uh, their policies implemented UK-wide. Now, um, Ems, I'll come to you first on this. Uh, Liz Truss has described Nicola Sturgeon as an attention seeker during the campaign. Do you think that's the right approach? Um, it's certainly not the type of language that I would use. I think it's better to focus on policies, which she has brilliant policies. Um, and I'm sure that's something that was taken out of context in the heat of a debate. But I am fully convinced that both candidates would be supporting the union continuing. And so, quite frankly, some of the, well, the actions outside of that debate that you mentioned in Perth um, and criticism of journalists and people who had different opinions shows quite the strength of feeling that um, exists in Scotland at the moment and how important it is for us to try and bring our union back together. Georgia, you know, you always hear how unpopular Boris Johnson has been in Scotland. Surely either candidate would provide however small a boost for the Conservatives uh, in Scotland. Yes, I imagine they probably would. Um, and I think that Liz Truss's comment about Nicola Sturgeon being an attention seeker was probably taken out of context because it just sounds it sounds amusing and it sounds because it sounds juvenile. Um, you know, obviously Nicola Sturgeon is a politician, so technically it is her job to be an attention seeker. Um, however, I do agree, actually, one of the things I do agree with both candidates on that having a Scottish referendum, independence referendum again in the next five years, it really just doesn't make sense because the last one was less than 10 years ago. And the whole idea proposed at the time in 2014 was that this would be a once in a generation vote to settle the issue for a while. And it's not once in a generation if you're doing if you're doing it less than a decade over and over again, possibly. It doesn't help the stability of Scotland, especially when it has also many issues of cost of living, many issues with education, drug deaths, etc. It needs to be dealing with. And I think, unfortunately, I think some SNP figures like to focus on the independence issue because it allows them to sort of steer away from bigger issues that are affecting Scotland right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I noticed that um, Rishi Sunak has said that he'd bring back union unit to beat Scottish independence. Now, I've got to, I, I've got to admit, as, as a former political reporter and uh, a bit of a geek with this stuff, I had to look up what union unit was. And it was the group first established at the start of last year, but was quickly replaced by the Secretive Union Strategy Committee after it lost two leaders in two weeks. I'm not sure how many of you three knew that. Um, Andrew, a good idea, bring back Union Unit or not? Well, you're the geek here. I have no <laughs> idea what Union Unit is. So I think the important thing here is both candidates, Rishi Sunak most particularly, have said that they will put Scotland under the spotlight more, the Scottish government. What is the Scottish government doing for the Scottish people for the large amounts of money under, under the Barnett formula, England, the UK government sends north of the border. So I think that's the key. They, uh, the SNP and Nicola Surgeon has effectively destroyed the Scottish uh, education system for where it was leading the countries before. Uh, the NHS is, is in a mess. And as Georgia was saying, the uh, drug problem is huge in, in uh, Scotland. So I think it, was, it wasn't it was taken out of context because it was part of the hostings on television. So she did say it, she probably meant to say it. And it, as Georgia is saying, it get, got her some headlines. Uh, what the important thing is to hold the Scottish government to account and hold the Scottish government to its commitments to Scottish people this one thing that Nicola Sturgeon has done for the past two years is turn everything into independence. That's her whole 
business in Scotland and it should be about looking after the Scottish people. Well, many thanks to all of you for joining me this evening here on Times Radio. That's Andrew Eyre, a councillor from Seven Oaks who's supporting Rishi Sunak, Ems Barr, former Conservative Special Advisor who's backing Liz Truss, and also my thanks to Georgia L. Gilholly, who has written for Conservative Home.